Okay, we're in Esther chapter 6 today. Esther chapter 6, verse 1 through 14. We'll look at Esther. As always, I greatly appreciate all of your help with the church, your support, your service, your your uh, prayers especially. Help us greatly. Thank you for that. I do pray for all of you. We are so thankful for all the ways you bless the church through your prayers. Um, so before we go into Esther chapter 6, let's ask the Lord to open our hearts to what he would have us hear. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name that you have allowed us this time to worship you, and receive our worship, and we pray right now that you would open our hearts to your spirit that we would hear what you have us here. Anoint my lips, Lord, that the words that come forth would be your words to us for your glory to build up your people. Thank you, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Esther is a very powerful book on the sovereignty of God, on the providential guidance of God through all of history and also in our lives today. Last uh, week in Esther 5, we learned how because we trust in God's sovereign hand, we can act with courage. We can act with wisdom because we trust in God's sovereign hand. Today, we're going to learn and how God, in his providential timing, brings about his ultimately good purposes. Today, we're going to talk about the timing of God's work in our lives and in history. How God in his providential timing, his sovereign wisdom, his power, his timing brings about his ultimately good purposes. Previously, there was animosity that we had learned between two central figures in the history of Esther and her life, the two figures being Haman, the highest ranking official in the Persian government, and Mordecai, an exiled Jew who had also raised uh, Esther, his cousin, since childhood. There was animosity that we learned that had developed between Haman and Mordecai. We see that in Esther 3, verse 5. Turn back to Esther 3. Chapter 3, verse 5. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. And that was... One of the central conflicts, the, the point of tension in, in the history of, of between the Jews and, and the Persian kingdom. And as a result, in verse 13 of Esther 3, let's jump to verse 13, Esther 3, verse 13. By the way, if you need a Bible, there's always plenty in the back on the counter there. So if you need one, just raise your hand and we'll give one to you. But you should always have a Bible uh, here. Esther 3, verse 13. Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with instruction to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. And so, horrified by Haman's decree to kill all Jews, Mordecai convinces Queen Esther to intercede on behalf of her people. Jump to Esther 4, verse 14. Esther chapter 4, verse 14. Mordecai tells Esther, For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And so at great risk to her life, Esther goes before the king uninvited and asks the king and Haman to come to a feast 
that she had prepared. Chapter 5 of Esther, Esther 5, verse 6. And as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king said to Esther, What is your wish? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. Then Esther answered, My wish and my request is, If I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my wish and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come to the feast that I will prepare for them. And tomorrow I will do as the king has said. And so Queen Esther invites Haman and the king to a second feast the following day after the first feast. And meanwhile, Haman's anger toward Mordecai continued to grow. Look at chapter 5, verse 9. Esther 5, verse 9. And Haman went out that day joyful and glad of heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he neither rose nor trembled before him, he was filled with wrath against Mordecai. His anger just grew even as he was invited to the queen's feast and given all the other uh, honors by the king in Persia, the highest ranking official, all of that. In spite of all that, his anger continued to grow against this Mordecai at the king's gate. And so Haman's wife and friends had a great idea, they thought. Haman's wife and his friends suggested a way to put an end to Mordecai. Verse 14 of chapter 5, Esther 5, verse 14. Then his wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, Let a gallows fifty cubits high be made, and in the morning tell the king to have Mordecai hanged on it. And then go joyfully with the king to the feast. And this idea pleased Haman, and he had the gallows made. And that's where we left it off, right? A cliffhanger, right? Right there at the end of chapter 5. A cliffhanger. And I know some of you told me, I couldn't wait. I, I started reading ahead, Pastor Darrell. That's great, great. Anytime you're in the Word, anytime you're eager to, to read the Bible, I'm not going to be against that. Read ahead if you want. But we're going to go verse by verse each each week uh, through the chapter and, and, and just dissect and, and see uh, what God is really telling us through the historical events of Esther and the Queen and the, and the, and the King of Persia Mordecai, her uh, cousin. Okay, so that's where we left it off. They're ready to hang Mordecai that next day. So we're looking at verse 1 now in chapter 6. Let's jump to Esther chapter 6 now. So we look at this morning. Verse 1. On that night, the king could not sleep. And he gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And so the night after attending Esther's first feast, for some reason, the king was unable to sleep. Something he ate, maybe? Perhaps he was wondering, what was Queen Esther holding back? Because at this point, he had not, she had not revealed what she really wanted. She just said, come to the feast. It was her first request. And then after the, the feast, she said, come to my second feast. And so perhaps the king was wondering, and he couldn't sleep about it, because he was wondering what Queen Esther had invited him to the second of the feast. Why did he invite her to the second feast, rather than just telling him what her request was? And so perhaps he was full of suspense. You know, the suspense was getting to him. He was tossing and turning that night, perhaps, wondering what was it that Esther was going to ask for? In any case... The king's inability to sleep that night was orchestrated by God himself. And we know that because as the king was unable to sleep that night, he requested that, quote, a book of memorable deeds be read to him. Was that pure coincidence? Okay, you decide. The king requested something called the Book of Memorable Deeds, the Chronicles, and they were read before the king. This is the middle of the night now. Okay, read me that book. Perhaps that will put me to sleep. Was that a coincidence? You decide. Verse 2. And it was found written how Mordecai had told about Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, 
who guarded the threshold and who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And the king said, What honor or distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's young men who attended him said, Nothing has been done for him. And so this event that they are reading about was actually recorded, if you remember, back in Esther chapter 2. Esther chapter 2, verse 21. If you jump back to Esther chapter 2, verse 21, it says, In those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, who guarded the threshold, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he told it to Queen Esther. And Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. And when the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows. And it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. The very book that he requested to be read. Now, how long had transpired between that event and actually this night where he asked for it? Five years. It's been five years. And finally he says, you know, read me that book. And then it just so happened that it talks about Mordecai and what he had done back in chapter 2, verse 21, five years earlier. Now, Persian kings were well known for rewarding loyal subjects generously. And so it must have surprised the king that he found out nothing had been done to reward Mordecai for saving the king's life. There was a plot to assassinate the king. Mordecai informed Esther about it. He told, she told the king, and it was foiled, the plot. And nothing had been done to reward Mordecai for this. And so it surprised him. It shocked him. He says, why has nothing been done yet? And so again, I ask you the question. Was it by pure coincidence that the king could not sleep that night? And was it pure coincidence that he asked for a book of a memorable deeds to be read to him? And was it pure coincidence that then he had heard about Mordecai's great act of loyalty, which had been gone, gone unrewarded? Was that just all by chance? The king wanted to do something immediately. As soon as he found out that Mordecai had not been rewarded, it's been five years, he wanted to do something about that immediately. Verse 4. And the king said, Who is in the court? Verse 4. Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to speak to the king about what? Having Mordecai hanged on the gallows. The same guy. I'm just coming in there to have Mordecai, remember he had a gallows built in chapter 5, the end, and now he's coming in there to ask that the king would have Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for him. That's why Haman was there. And so it just so happened that Haman had entered the king's outer court having come to ask for the king of all people to have Mordecai to be hanged on the gallows that he had built. And at this point, as you can see, there are just too many coincidences to not see that God was involved in what was taking place. Too many coincidences. Have you ever had that situation happen where it's just one thing after another and you say, well, that's a coincidence. Well, that's a coincidence. And all of this seems to be something that is going for something much greater than you, and you start thinking, perhaps God is doing this. Okay. So at this point, there was just too many coincidences to see that God was that not that see to not see that God was involved in everything that was taking place. And so, verse five, and the king's young men told him, Haman is there standing in the court, and the king said, Let him come in. Now we'll pause right there because Haman had come, as you remember, to seek to have Mordecai put to death. But of course, God had other plans. Right at that moment, Mordecai's life was in danger. Haman, the highest ranking Persian official, was going there that day to have to ask that Mordecai be hanged on that gallows that he had just built. And it just so happened that that night, 
The king could not sleep, had the book of memorable deeds read to him, and he found out that Mordecai saved the king's life five years earlier and was never recognized or rewarded for it. Have you ever noticed that God's timing is not always the same as our timing? That God's timing is often different than what we would prefer. You know, I wish that, you know, when I think, I pray for things, that it would happen right away, right? If you're like me, when I pray for something, I wish it would come quickly, right? We all wish it would come quickly. Who likes to wait? And so as you are growing in your relationship with Christ and you're praying to him, you should learn, as we all do, that God's timing is not always the same as our timing. You ever notice that sometimes God will take action at what seems to us the last possible minute. Like, why did you wait so long? That's great, but, but why did you wait forever, it seems like? Why did I have to go through all this other stuff before you answered my prayers? You ever thought that? Why does it often happen that way, that God takes action at what seems to be the last possible moment? And the answer often is, so that we will learn to trust him. That's why. God answers in his own timing so that we will learn to trust him. We have to trust him. Because if you're like me, when you want something, you want it right away. Right? Who likes waiting? Okay, when we pray, we, we don't want to say, okay, I'll wait two years for this. You know, I'll wait ten years. Or I'll even wait till tomorrow sometimes. We don't even want to wait till tomorrow for certain things. Whether it's waiting for a job, waiting for God to reveal to us who our future mate is. I have a colleague of ours who's waiting for his visa to be approved to stay in this country. That if he doesn't get this visa approved, extended, he's going to be sent back to Japan with his family. He has no idea when it's going to happen, if it's going to happen. And so we're praying. We all have to wait for God's answer. Waiting is tough, isn't it? Waiting is very tough at times when we pray. Sometimes it's agonizing to wait, depending on what it is. It's agonizing sometimes to wait. But I always try to remember this, and this would probably help you as well. That when you are praying... And you want something really bad and you keep praying about it. And yes, you should. And you're showing faith. That's great. But if I and if we always received what we wanted, when we wanted it, then how would we ever grow? Answer that question for yourself. If you always received what you wanted, when you wanted it, how then would you grow as a believer in Jesus Christ? Psalm Chapter 27, Psalm 27, verse 14 says, Wait for Yahweh. Be strong and take, let your heart take courage. Wait for Yahweh. That's what people had to do all throughout history to learn to wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage and wait for the Lord. And it's hard. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's very difficult to do that. But then I thought, if God always gave me everything I asked for when I wanted it, how would I ever grow? How would I ever grow in my relationship with Christ? How would you ever grow if you always got what you wanted when you wanted it? Mordecai's act of loyalty went unrecognized for years. Saved the king's life. And for years... No one recognized him for it. But at just the right time, at just the right time, the opportune time, five years later, God knew this was the right time. Was it not? Just before he was going to be hanged on a gallows? Now they recognize, hey, this Mordecai did a great thing for me. What has been done to reward him? It happened five years later, but it was a just the right time. And God does that for us as well. We have no idea why it takes long, or sometimes prayers get answered quickly. I'm not saying that every time you have to wait. Sometimes my prayers get answered quickly, and yours do too. 
And sometimes they don't. They take longer. And we, we wonder why. We have no clue. Mordecai had no clue why he was unrecognized for five years. And then at the, just the right time, his deed was recognized. And so in his wisdom, God acts at just the right time so that we will grow in Christ and learn to trust him. Learn to trust him. That he knows what he's doing better than we understand. We may not under we, we, we won't understand all the things he does. That's just part of being human. We're very limited in our wisdom. As wise as you think you know things and as smart as you are, no, I'm 50, 60, 80, 100 years you may live on this earth, you have no understanding of God's great wisdom. Okay, minuscule. No matter how much you know God's word, how much I know God's word, my wisdom and understanding is minuscule compared to the wisdom of God and his ways. And so God acts in his great timing so that we will learn to put our trust in him. And when the king realized that Mordecai had not been rewarded for his act of loyalty, he wanted to do something about it immediately. And so verse 6, he asked, well, who's in the court? Verse 5, well, Haman's out there. Well, let him come in. Verse 6. So Haman came in, and the king said to him, now get this, this is what he asked Haman when he first walked in. What should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? What should be done to the man the king delights to honor? And Haman said to himself, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? Right? Immediately he starts thinking, he must be thinking of me. The one he wants to honor, of course. So in his arrogance, Haman thought the king intended to honor him. And so Haman was eager to answer the king's question. Well, verse 7. And Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown is set. And let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials and let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor and let them lead him on that horse through the square of the city proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. What a great way to reward someone the king wants to honor. And so Haman thought of how he would like to be honored when he was answering the question because he assumed, I mean, who more than me would the king want to honor? And gee, what would I would want? And so he thought of the way that he would like to be honored, the royal robes and the king's horse wearing a crown and being led by one of the king's most noble officials and throughout the city and then shouting before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. And so Amon was basically wanting to be treated like a king himself, right? I want to be treated like that, like a king, like the crown prince. But then something unimaginable happened, right? Then the most humiliating thing imaginable happened to Haman, verse 10. Then the king said to Haman, Hurry! Take the robes and the horse, as you have said, and do so to Mordecai, the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Leave out nothing that you have mentioned. Ooh. He just like probably was almost died of shock. Do everything that you just said to Mordecai, the Jew. So Haman had to treat his most hated enemy like the crown prince and parade him throughout the city wearing royal robes. Now remember, Haman had just come to the king to ask permission to hang to have Mordecai hanged on a gallows because he hated his guts. Now he has to honor that same man and treat him like royalty, in public, in front of all of his friends 
and his family. Could anything be more incredible than the providential will of God? Can't make this stuff up. Okay. God is far more amazing than I think what we can make up in our own minds. Could anything be more incredible than that? Almost impossible to believe. Mordecai thought that his act of loyalty was forgotten five years earlier. He thought that he was, I mean, I guess they haven't rewarded me yet, so they're never going to remember it. He thought his deed was forgotten. And now he is highly honored at the best time possible by his greatest enemy. You see that? Now he's highly honored at the best time possible by his greatest enemy. Because Mordecai, I mean, Haman had to be the one that prayed. Because this is one of your most noble officials. Who's more noble and higher ranking than Haman? Have him lead Mordecai through the streets, shouting, Thus shall it be done for the one that the king delights to honor. This happened at the best possible time. Because God had that plan. Five years earlier. Verse 11. So Haman took the robes and the horse... And he dressed Mordecai and led him through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. And you can imagine how he felt when he was saying those things. Okay, he was he felt like he was chewing cow manure. That's how it felt like. He rather he rather probably be eating dung at that moment than saying those words. Honestly. He would hate to do that, but that's what he had to do. King's orders. Can you imagine such a reversal as that? See, when it comes to determining in your own life, in our lives, when it comes to determining if certain coincidences that happen in our lives were specifically ordained by God or not, it is always wisest to be careful and discerning. See, in my own experience, and maybe you've understood this, in my own experience, there have been times where something would occur that in my life that seemed to be more than coincidental. Right? You ever had that where you're something that happened and you go, wow, was that just a coincidence or did God do something? And there were times like that that it would occur where something seemed to be more than coincidental and seemed to indicate that God was working through it. Oh, maybe God is up to something. Maybe God is doing something. But there were times when I thought that, and I, you know, I surmised that, I, 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 I believed that, but as time went by, nothing came of it. Turned out it was nothing. It was false alarm, you know. I just made an assumption. Turned out not to be true. Nothing came of it. There were other times where I wasn't thinking too much about God's sovereign will, or timing in my life. But later on, years later, when I look back, then I realized how everything seemed to have just fallen in place at just the right time to make something happen. And I realized after the fact, God was working. So sometimes when you think God is working, he's not. It's just you assuming, oh, well, God's coincidental. No, not really. You'll see, you'll see. Time will tell. Nothing happens. Nothing really came. And the other times where I wasn't even had a clue. Yet God was working. And I'll give you an example. It's like how I met my wife. And I told you this before. Okay, when I met my wife, I didn't actually didn't meet my wife, even though I should have met my wife. And what I mean by that, um, I learned after the fact that my wife and I were not meant to meet until just the right time. Because we had ample opportunity to meet each other, we found out later. We went on a four-day retreat at the same time, the same place together. We talked to the same people. She talked to the people that I knew from my campus. I talked to her people, and I never saw her once, and she never saw me. I never even heard of her. She was there for four days at the same retreat. I never saw her, never remember. I never remember seeing her. I talked to some of the other people, her friends. That she, oh, was so-and-so there? Yeah, I talked to that person from your friend, and she talked to my friends. She never saw me. I never saw her. What? And then later on, we went to another event, 
And it was an all-day event, and I remember talking to her friend that she was with, and she remember talking to some of my friends. And again, I don't remember seeing her. I don't remember. It's like, uh, there, was, there were times like that we would, we would be at the same things all day together, four days together, and never once I ever even, when I saw her, I never wrecked, I didn't say, oh, I remember that person. I never remember. It's just weird. Until the right time. Because in God's sovereign will, I wasn't going to talk to her. I wasn't going to see her. I wasn't going to know she existed until the right time. Probably until I grew up some more or something. He knew I needed to mature before I met her. So my point is, is that we don't, just because you read this story, don't, don't think that every little thing that happened that's coincidental, oh, that must be God. It may, it may not be. Use wisdom, use discernment. Wait and see. Because sometimes things will happen later on and you realize, oh, I see how God brought it about for me to, let's say, you know, whatever, whatever the points, whatever, whatever God was doing. But other times I'll think, oh, maybe God's doing something. No. Okay, so I, I'm not saying that you should think every little coincidence is God's will. It's not. Because in God's sovereign's will, he knows the right time. The point is that Haman had his own plans. Haman's plan was to do what? Have Mordecai hanged on a gallows. That morning he was going on his way in the court of king to ask him that very question. Can you hang that dude, Mordecai? I can't stand him. He doesn't bow to me. Haman had his plans. That's the point. But God had other plans. Right? That's, that's basically the point here. Haman had his own plans to kill Mordecai, but God overruled them. Proverbs chapter 19 verse 21 says, Many are the plans in the mind of man, but it is the purpose of Yahweh that will stand. Many are the plans in the mind of man, but it is the purpose of Yahweh that will stand. I may have plans, you may have plans, but it doesn't mean anything unless God is in it. It's the purposes of God that will actually be, take place, not what I want, not what you want. Many are the plans in our minds, but it is the God's purposes that will stand. And that's what happened here with Mordecai and Haman. He had plans, but God overruled them. God has plans to make us more. Now, this is his plan. Now, listen to this. What is God's plan for you? So, well, I don't know what his plan is. We do from Scripture. You know what his plan is? To make us more like Christ. First, to receive his gift of salvation, and then to become more and more like Christ. God has plans to make us more like Christ even when we don't see it. And even when it seems he has forgotten about us. But that's always his plan. Help you to trust him more, like Jesus. Help you to love him more, like Jesus. Help him be more faithful, like Jesus. He wants you to make, make you more like Christ. So be ready to see him forever in heaven. And this happens, this plan is carried out in your life, even when you don't see it, and it, when it seems he's forgotten about you, us. That's still his plan. And so God acts at just the right time so we'll learn to trust him. And God's plan is to make us more like Christ even when it seems we're forgotten. Because you're not forgotten. He's always looking out for you and wants to help you to grow more and more like Christ. So after Haman had to honor Mordecai now by parading him through the city wearing the royal robes, as you might imagine, Haman was devastated. He was humiliated. Verse 12. Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house, mourning and with his head covered. 
with his head covered means that he was so ashamed, so humiliated, he couldn't even bear to show his face in public. How humiliating. I have to parade Mordecai of all people and shout before him, thus it shall be done for the one that king wants to honor. That should have been me up there. And I have to do that for Mordecai. He had his head covered. Couldn't show his face in public. He had sought Mordecai's death for not bowing to him, but instead he was forced to honor him. And when Haman went home that day, he sought comfort from his wife and friends. Verse 13. And Haman told his wife, Zeresh, and all his friends, everything that had happened to him. It's interesting how he says everything that had happened to him when it was his own doing, right? He was the one that picked the fight with Mordecai. He's the one that couldn't stand him. He's the one that had the gallows made. He's the one that was going to go in there and have him hang, but I digress. But he, but, you know, whenever we mess up our lives, how, how it is, you know how it is, it's always, well, look what happened to me. It didn't happen to you. You did this to yourself. But well, that's how he frames it. He goes to his wife and all his friends to tell them all that had happened to him, as if he had nothing to do with it. Then his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. You will surely fall before him. Isn't that encouraging? From your own wife and friends? See, at this point, even his wife and his friends were starting to panic. Because all of them were in despair over Mordecai's, or over Haman's, actually, impending doom. They're all in despair because they knew Haman was doomed. If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but you will surely fall before him. Such encouraging friends, huh? Wow, thanks for the encouragement. You will surely fall. These were the same people, mind you, that had encouraged Haman to have the gallows built. Remember? They were the same ones that encouraged him to have the gallows built and asked the king to have Mordecai hanged on it. That's back in chapter 5, verse 14, right? Then his wife, Zeresh, and all his friends said to him, let a gallows be made. They're the ones that put him up to it. And now after they heard of the dramatic turn of events that had taken place, how first of all the king couldn't sleep that night, how he then had the book of memorable deeds read to him, how he then learned about the Mordecai foiling the plot against his life, and how the king wanted to honor Mordecai, and then how Haman was the one who had to parade Mordecai through the streets like a crown prince. It was then they realized, after all that had happened, that this had to be by the hand of God. They sensed it. They knew it. You're doomed. That's what they mean. Right? That's what they mean by if Mordecai before whom, by, before whom you have begun to fall is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but you will surely fall. What they meant was, God is with him. Look at all that had happened. They realized that all of this had to be by the hand of God. The God of Israel was acting on Mordecai's behalf, clearly. Because up to this point, Haman had already been successful in his life. Up to this point, remember, Haman was highly successful. He was Wealthy, he was powerful, he was the king's highest ranking official. But all of that he had and achieved wasn't enough to satisfy him. This wasn't enough for him. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 10. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. He who loves money, or you can put in, put in their power, 
or prestige or whatever you want, fill in the blank. He who loves something other than God, money, wealth, power, whatever it is, will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. So instead, Haman became obsessed with getting revenged on Mordecai. That was his downfall. He became obsessed with getting revenge on Mordecai because he would not bow to him. And so verse 14 of Esther 6, while they were yet talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and uh, to arrived and hurried to bring Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared, the second feast. While they were still talking about this, despairing over that you're going to fall before this Mordecai now, you're doomed, we're doomed. The king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared, the second feast. Now was the time to face the music and to find out what Esther's request was. Sometimes success in your life and in our lives, sometimes success and being successful can be as much of a challenge for a person spiritually as failure. Hear what I said? Sometimes success can be as much of a challenge or trial may even to a person spiritually as failure. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 21 says, The crucible is for silver, and the furnace is for gold, and a man is tested by his praise. Deep words. The crucible is for silver. That's how you refine silver. You put it under heat. Okay, crucible. Get out its impurities. The furnace is for gold. Again, taking out the impurities through high heat. And a man is tested how? By trial? No, by his praise, by his success. A man is tested by his praise. When things are going well, when we are succeeding, when we are getting what we want, I ask you the question. Will we honestly pray more to God as a result of all that he's blessed us with? Will you pray more or will you pray less? Be honest. When things are going well in your life, when you're succeeding and you're getting everything that you want, will you honestly pray more to God or will you pray less? And then the second question is, now why would God want for us that which would drive us away from him rather than toward him? Think about that. Because if the answer honestly for me is, you know what, if God gives me everything I want, I honestly over time, I mean, maybe initially I'll pray to him, but I'll pray less than I do now then why would God want for us that which, which would drive us away from him rather than toward him? Why would God want that? See, I, as I personally have been praying to God every day, and many of you have as well, as I've been praying every day, sometimes I have this thought. If God gives me what I ask for, will I pray to him less after he gives it to me? Will I depend on him less? if he gives me what I ask for over time? And because if the answer is yes, unfortunately, I hate to say this yes, I, I probably will peter out in my prayers. I'll probably pray, pray to him less than before if he gives me everything I want and everything I ask for. If the answer is yes, then my relationship with God is not what it should be. And so I told myself this, that I can't let myself pray less just because God answers my prayers. Sounds strange, right? I can't pray to him less just because he gives me what I want. 
I will not let that happen. I had to, to, to think in my own mind, am I going to pray to him less if he gives me what I want? And I have to tell myself, no, I'm determined not to let that happen. Told myself I can't let myself pray less and depend on him less just because he answers my prayers. Because that's crazy. That would be crazy to do that. Why would you pray to him less? He gave you what you wanted. But that's human nature. That's honestly where I am. And maybe you relate to that. Because if God honestly gave me everything I wanted, when I wanted it, or gave me what I asked for, would I really pray to him more? Or would I pray to him less? I can't let that happen. That's what I vow. I say, I can't let that happen. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 8. The, the, the man who wrote Proverbs 30 says this. Now listen carefully. Give me poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Who is Yahweh? You see what he's saying? Give me neither poverty nor riches. You're going to think, well, why would you not want riches? I mean, everybody wants to win the lottery, right? Right? Who, who doesn't want to win the lottery? Who doesn't want to be rich? He says, no, give me neither poverty. Don't give me riches either. Why not? Just feed me with the food that is needful for me. Give me just what I need for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? See what he's saying? Because I have so much, I'll deny you. Because I have so much, I'll say, who is the Lord? Because I've been spoiled with what you've blessed me with, I'm going to pray to you less. I'm going to depend on you less. And so he wisely says, don't give me too much because I know my heart and I will deny you eventually. I will forget about it. I'll pray to you less. I'll depend on you less. And so he actually says, don't give me poverty. Don't give me riches. Just give me what I need. Because I might be get so full of myself, I'll be so spoiled and I'll deny you. Who of us has the courage to understand that? That sometimes God doesn't give you everything you want because it's for your own spiritual good. That God, because he loves you, he'll give you what you need, but not everything you think you want or that you say that you want because you'll deny him and you'll be full and you'll say, who is the Lord? See, I like to say this, and I've said this before. God is not a vending machine. God is not a vending machine. What do I mean by that? You know, you go to a vending machine, you have a coin, and say those are our prayers. And you put in the coins, and you get the little Coke or the snack that you get out. And so you put in the, 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 the coins, and you get out something. And so if you think God is like that, God is a vending machine, you think these prayers are the coins you're putting in, the money you're putting in, and so then when you put the coins in, you put the coins in and the treat doesn't come out right away, or the, the Coke doesn't come out, you're going to say, that dumb vending machine, and you kick it and it doesn't work, and you stop praying. You stop giving money to, to that vending machine because it doesn't work. I'm going to stop praying. I'm going to stop giving to it. But God's not a vending machine. He's not obligated to give you what you want when you want it because he knows better. And that's what happens. And, and on the other hand, if you you put money in the vending machine and you get the coke, are you going to keep putting money in afterwards? No. Who does that? Okay, you already got the coke. You got a snack. You're not going to keep putting coins in after you already got the, the the coke or the snack, right? But God's not a vending machine. You don't stop praying just because you got what you want. And so some of us think God is like this vending machine. Like, you know, once you get what you want, stop putting money in because why do you want to put money? Why do you keep praying after you got what you want? He's not a vending machine. Or, you know, if you keep putting money in and nothing comes out, then I'm not going to get put money in anymore. I'm not going to pray anymore. And that's what I mean by that. Some of us treat him like he's a vending machine. You know, it's, it's just, if I, if I get something in return, then I'll keep putting money. If I don't, then I'm not going to stop. And if I do get what I want, and I'm not going to put money anymore, why, who puts money in a vending machine after I already got what I wanted? We've got to get away from that understanding that he's like a vending machine. He's not. You need to pray to him always. You depend on him always. And you don't pray any less just because you get what you want. At certain times and situations, the best thing, now mind you, the best thing that God could do 
at certain times and situations is to not give us what we ask for. See, in light of all I said, you understand what I'm saying? There are certain times and situations that the best thing that God could do is to not give you what you're asking for. I invite you to think about that. Sometimes that's the best thing for you. And for me. And I've learned that as I prayed to him. And do I, do I give up? I said, well, if he's not going to give me what I want, then why do I pray? Nope. I'll keep praying. I'll keep praying. As we say, you know, learn, you know that you know God shows the parable of the woman uh, who went to the unjust judge, and before he showed that parable, Jesus said he told a parable to show to tell people that to encourage them to always that they always ought to pray and not give up, right? And then at the end of that parable of the the, the unjust judge, he said, "When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Who's still going to be faithful in praying to Jesus?" When the, when the end comes, when, when the prayers have, some have been answered, some have not been. When sometimes the best thing that God could do for us is not give us what we ask for at times, and sometimes He will give us what we ask for. But will there be faith on earth? Will people still be praying? See, God acts at just the right time. Remember this. God acts at just the right time to help us grow and to trust Him. And God's plan is to make us more like Jesus, even when we don't realize it. And because God loves us, he may not give you what we want when we want it. He'll give it when it's best, because he loves you. Father, we thank you that you are a God who's sovereign, and you work clearly in, in the life of Esther and Mordecai and even Haman. Because you knew what's best. Clearly you acted. Clearly you orchestrated all these incredible events because you had a plan. And nothing can thwart your plans. We trust in that. And those plans are good. Thank you that you want us to become more like Christ for our own good. Sometimes, Father, you even deny my requests because you know that's best for me. And that's fine. I trust you, Lord. But I will not stop praying. I will not give up on you, Lord, because... You never give up on me. Thank you, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name.